All right, we are live. Welcome to those joining. We will give a few moments. We have about four minutes before we start, so come on in and get situated. Hi, Candice. Hello. Welcome. Hello to everyone else that's joining. Hi, Leah. All right. Hi, Shanae. Good afternoon. Hello, JM Outdoor Life. Not sure I know who that is. Welcome, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful week. I hope that you are continuing to enjoy the lessons we've been getting into kind of the meat of the lessons right so before now has just been kind of laying down the foundations and now we're getting into the actual you know kind of where the rubber meets the road um applications of how we now put into um action into perspective what we have been learning all along and so i pray that you guys are being challenged that you are hopeful that you are finding victory and even if you're not finding victory that you are encouraged that victory is available and that there is a different way to do things other than um, quite possibly the way that you have been doing things so looking forward to our discussion today lots of material so i'll try to at least touch on as much as possible um obviously we can't cover in an hour what we take in a week to go through but hopefully the highlight points will be points of encouragement and um, motivation. So, all right, well, it's noon, so we're gonna pray and get started. I have found the lessons to be very eye-opening and convicting. They keep getting better and better. Who knew it was possible, right, right? Hello, internet, welcome. Yeah, if you don't think it's possible for them to get better, and actually, every time you go through it, it gets even better. Like, the lessons progressively gets better. And then you go through it again. And it's just, like, how could it be possible that it was better than the first time? And it just, I can honestly say that it has been better um, each time. So, all right. Well, let us pray. And we'll go, go ahead and get started. Lord, we're so thankful for having the opportunity to come together and study these lessons. We are just thankful for how far we've gotten up to lesson eight. We thank you for the many lessons that you have taught us. We thank you for the power that is available to live out these lessons. And we ask for that power. Even right now, I ask that every mother, every father, grandparent, aunt, uncle, friend, who is desirous to be able to teach these lessons through your power will be able to do so indeed. Be with us as we discuss in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right. Okay, so uh, before we get started, we did decide to move the all night prayer. It will not be tonight. It will be in two weeks, July 13th, Friday the 13th. Um, if you're interested in leading out, I think we actually have most of the slots filled, but if you're interested in leading out in song service or contributing in any way, um, please let me know or Andrea, and we will make sure that you are able to participate. Please feel free to invite family, friends, coworkers, um, church members, neighbors, whoever you think might benefit from this all night of prayer. Um, I know last time we had several people on that were not members of this class um, and maybe even a couple that weren't members of our church so um, that were greatly blessed and I think all that participated were greatly blessed and so we want to be sure to share. Um, it will not be recorded only because it is, you know, it's eight hours. Is it eight hours? I don't know, it's a lot of hours. And so um, we only have limited space to house recordings. And I can't imagine, you know, how many people would actually go back and listen to that much prayer. And the whole point is to be, you know, for it to be real time and to receive the the blessing. So hopefully we'll have enough of them that if you're not able to join that you can join and, um, you know, join for an hour. You don't have to be on the whole night. Come on for an hour if you have an hour um, because each hour kind of follows the same format. So come on and, you know, get in what you can. All right. Okay. Hold on a second. I'm moving stuff. In my. All right. I'm going to grab my water. Hold on. All right. Here we go. So I bought this cup and it looks like a Yeti, but it's in, it's an Atlin and it was $16 on Amazon, which is much cheaper. The Yetis are like 30, 40 bucks. Hi, Tanya. Welcome. And so if you're in, and it works just like the Yeti, like you wouldn't know it wasn't a Yeti, except that it has a different name on it and it comes with a metal straw. Um, I really like it. So anyway. Check that out if you're interested. All right, so let's go. Okay, I'm so sorry, guys. I need to get myself together here. Hold on. My phone's plugged up and I keep hitting the cord and knocking it over. All right, there we go. All right. Okay, so we're on chapter eight, obedience and discipline. And I'm just going to read this first paragraph to... Um, on page, I believe it's 271, I wrote here. It's 238 in my book, but I believe it's 271 in the updated copy. And it comes from Child Guidance, page 21. And it says, fathers and mothers need to understand their responsibility. The world is full of snares for the feet of the young. Multitudes are attracted by a life of selfish and sensual pleasure. They cannot discern the hidden dangers or the fearful ending of the path that seems to them the way of happiness. Through the indulgence of appetite and passion, their energies are wasted and millions are ruined for this world and for the world to come. Parents should remember, <coughs> excuse me, that their children must encounter these temptations. Even before the birth of a child, the preparation should begin that will enable it to fight successfully the battle against evil. So let's pause right there for a minute. So temptation is a part of the human experience. It is necessary even... <coughs> Excuse me for just a minute. Christopher, can you come turn the fan on? It is necessary for growth. Parents should expect it and know that it's coming. And even before the child is born, 
should be making preparations to deal with these temptations. And that comes through the parent mastering temptation, right? We're told that John the Baptist was born with the Holy Spirit, and that's how he was born with the Holy Spirit, because his mother was filled with the Holy Spirit. She had learned the way of salvation, and because she had learned the way of salvation, then she was able to teach her child, even before he was born, to experience the the way of salvation through self-denial and surrender. More than human wisdom is needed by parents at every step that they may understand how best to educate their children for a useful, happy life here and for higher service and greater joy hereafter. Now, this was actually very encouraging to me because what this says to me is that my wisdom, what I know, what other people know is really not enough for me to train these children. And you can listen to some great people and some great parenting seminars. You can read this book and reading this book alone is not going to help you raise your children. You need the wisdom of God. You need to learn how to cooperate with God. This book, other people's information is just to assist you in how to learn to cooperate from with God that you may learn um, the wisdom from him. And if you ever listen to people who have really experienced this victory, um, they will tell you that they prayed, you know, and God told them to, to do a certain discipline or to, you know, do a certain thing with their children. It was, it was in their time with God. It was, it was the wisdom that came from God that helped them to be successful in as being in being a parent all right so now we move on to the story of the rich young ruler and we will highlight some points that are related to this lesson that will help us to understand how to relate to this story and how to relate it to obedience now, this lesson points out that Jesus had been blessing the children. And in the context of him blessing the children comes the rich ruler because now he wants a blessing. He knows he needs a blessing. And he believes that this blessing is all that he needs. Like, what's missing in his life? Oh, and so he's watching Jesus bless the children. Oh, that's what I need. I need a blessing from Jesus. And believing that Jesus was just going to pronounce upon him a blessing. And then he was just going to go on his little merry way and do what he had been doing. And to his shock, that is not what Jesus did at all. Right? Jesus did not give him a blessing. He gave him a challenge that he was not willing to accept. That maybe he didn't know how to accept, but um, he did not accept it nonetheless and so he comes to him he says what shall i do to inherit eternal life it says here that he was young he was filled with youthful eagerness he was also rich and desired to have his soul's need satisfied hi nicola welcome it has been quite a while long time i hope you're doing well now it's important to note that he really did want to have his soul his soul's desire filled so i think a lot of times we look at the rich young ruler and we just feel like his motivation was in the wrong place and of course his motivation was in the wrong place but as we'll see that wasn't his problem because Jesus met a lot of people whose motivation was in the wrong place. Nicodemus's motivation was in the wrong place. Um, yet he benefited from his meeting with Christ, right? And so we 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 will you we can look through the scripture and see many people who came to Christ, you know, not in in the right way necessarily, but they were still benefited by 
their meeting with him because when he showed them their plague spot, they surrendered to him. And so we go on. Um, the rich young ruler says, you know, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet in his heart? He really believed that he had been keeping the commandments and he probably had from a legal perspective. And we'll talk about that, right? Because we don't want to parent from a legal perspective. We want to parent from a perspective of love, obedience that comes from love, which is very different from obedience of law. And that's why many of our youth are leaving the church because they have only known an obedience of law. It's not, it's not attached to love. It's just, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm just going to look like I'm doing right. But there's, there's no heart felt motivation to do things because they love either God or their parents or both, right? All right. Let's see. We're not going to go through the whole story just because I'm sure most of you already know this story. We're just highlighting the um the points on this next page let's see what page it is for you 71 to 273 it says jesus saw in this ruler just the help he needed if the young man would become a co-laborer with him in the work of salvation if he would place himself under christ's guidance he would be a power for good if he would do what if he would place himself under Christ's guidance. In a marked degree, the ruler could have represented Christ. For he possessed qualifications, which if he were united with the Savior, would enable him to become a divine force among men. So this reminds me of when Ellen White talks about the stubborn child. And how it's not necessarily bad for the children to be stubborn. We have to teach the child how to be stubborn for the right thing, right? So it's, it's not, you want a child that's not easily persuaded. It's not a bad thing that the child is not easily persuaded. What's bad is if the child is not easily persuaded for good, right? If the child is not easily persuaded to evil, who would say that's a bad thing? It's not a bad thing that they're stubborn, but that stubbornness must be sanctified. I hope I'm saying that right. Y'all know what I mean. Like, you know, okay. So I'm, I'm not saying it's okay to be obstinate, but what I'm saying is it's okay for the child to not easily be persuaded or moved because once the child understands principles on the side of right, they will not easily be moved from those principles. Amen? Because that is a part of their personality. And so God will take that very personality trait and he will sanctify it and he will use it for his good. And it'll be 50 children doing wrong. And then one little child will be sitting over in the corner, <laughs> minding their own business because like, mm -mm, I'm not, you know what I mean? And so we don't want to, she talks about breaking the spirit of children. We don't want to break their spirit. If they are sensitive and you know, I mean, we just, we, we don't want to break that sensitivity because they may very well need that sensitivity for the work that God has called them to do. We just want that sensitivity to be balanced and we want it to be rooted and anchored in, in Christ. Christ was sensitive, but he was also firm and bold. And so, um, he, he, he did not lack in sensitivity, but he was balanced and he knew when to use that sensitivity. Amen. Hello, Michelle Ann. Okay, so let's keep going. <clears throat> um, oh, wait a minute. I was reading. Let's see. Christ, seeing into his character, loved him. Love, high care, and welcome. Love for Christ was awakening in the ruler's heart. For love begets love. Jesus longed to see him a co-worker with him. He longed to make him like himself. A mirror in which the likeness of God would be reflected. He longed to develop the excellence of his character. Did you hear that? This rich young ruler who turned away from Christ had some excellence in his character. 
he was he was not all bad. He was not just a spoiled bad apple. There was hope for him, right? If the ruler had then given himself to Christ, he would have grown in the atmosphere fear of his presence. If he had made this choice, how different would have been his future? So how does that apply to us as parents? <clears throat> what this says is, one, most children have some excellent qualities. Even if they are just B-A-D, bad children, usually they they have some, some, some kind of good qualities, right? They're usually good and bargaining or I don't know you could think of some little bad child that you know and that that child usually has some they may be using that good quality for bad but it's still a good quality it's still an excellent quality right and so this rich young ruler had excellent qualities but he had not been taught to surrender them to God and he did not know how to come to Christ and say I don't know how to do that. Like, I want to do that. But if you can teach me how, then I will do that. And that was his problem. His problem was not that he loved money. His problem was not that. His problem was that he was not willing to submit that love to God, right? And so we have to remember that because many of us don't come to God because of our issues. That's why you need God right <laughs> like okay like we have missed the entire ship when when we think like that why well, i'm not gonna come to god because i have problems watching stuff right and come to god with your problem watching that stuff that you need god to get rid of the problem if you could get rid of the problem on your own then you would not need god okay all right um Okay, and let's read on this on the bottom of page 273. Study how to teach the children to be thoughtful of others. The youth should be early accustomed to submission, self-denial, and regard for others' happiness. They should be taught to subdue the hasty temperature, temperature, temper, to withhold the passionate word, to manifest unbearing kindness, courtesy, and self-control. Now, how are they taught this? Mostly through example. If mommy is hasty, the children are going to be hasty, right? So mommy's not going to be able to teach the children not to be hasty if mommy has not learned the lesson of not being hasty. And so we must master these lessons first learning them from Christ, and then we're able to model these behaviors and these lessons to our children so that they can see what being quiet, not being hasty, not saying words that we regret. They should be able to see what that looks like because we're demonstrating this to them. All right. How carefully should parents manage their children in order to counteract every inclination to selfishness they should continually suggest ways by which their children may become thoughtful for others and learn to do things for their fathers and mothers who are doing everything for them so this begins in the home you teach your children to do things for their siblings for their parents for the neighbors for people at church for other Family members, there's always something that can be done. You don't have any family close by. You can go to a nursing home and sing to the people there. You can you can feed the homeless. You can volunteer in a homeless shelter. You can make something and take it to someone at church. But the whole point is you're thinking, what can I do for someone else? And I tell you, in my own personal experience, this is one of the greatest remedies, that's the word I'm looking for, to selfishness. Like thinking outward, thinking what can I do for someone else. When you train your children to 
constantly think about doing something for someone else, then you you won't see the uh, many of the problems that you see with them being bored and always wanting something to do because there's always something to do for someone. It's just there's not there's never a time when someone doesn't need something. So you could even if you don't have any money, you could write a little note, right, to to give to someone of how you appreciate them, how you're thinking about them. There's just things that you can do that that cost next to nothing but show love and appreciation and give the child a chance to express their love and their appreciation to someone else. All right. <clears throat> now, it asked a question here. Did you notice the commandments which were quoted talking about when Christ is speaking to the rich young ruler? He doesn't quote on the commandments. And why not? Because the rich young ruler's problem was not how he treated God necessarily. I mean, obviously we know it is because if he had treated God the way he was supposed to, then he would treat his fellow man the way he's supposed to, right? Because when the love for God is what it should be, then love for a fellow man will be what it should be. But in his heart, he really believed that his love for God was okay. Like, that's why he approached Jesus. Like he knew Jesus was sent from God. And he really felt like he was in a in a right standing with him. And he really reminds me of Laodicea, right? Because he's rich. He's increased with goods. And he really has need of nothing but a blessing from Jesus. That's what he thinks. He really thinks he's in a right standing with Christ. And he comes to meet Christ confidently is that Ellen White says of the Lord Laodicean church they are confidently waiting for the appearing of their savior so he confidently approaches the master to ask him for a blessing wow like are you serious that you have a plague spot in your heart and you're asking for something no no he just he had no clue what condition he was in and so Christ calls to him the commandments that deal with his fellow brethren and he just he just was not trying to hear it he he was he went away sorrowful because the thought of him having to separate from his riches and give up the life that he had tried so hard to build the thought of that was just really unbearable to him and so what we don't want is to teach our children to to build this dream. That's that's what that's the worldly thought process, right? You go to school, you get an education, you you major in something that's gonna make you a lot of money. So you need to be a lawyer, you need to be a doctor, you need to be something. You need to start your own company. Um so that you can make money and be rich and, and make a name for yourself. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of the mindset that he was in. And he had really reached that, right? He was, he was rich. He had all the money that he needed. And that was his security. That money was his life. And so when God asked him to give that up, he, he could not bear to do so. The thought of doing such was painful to him. And so he went away sad that he was asked to, to, to give up this money in order to receive what Christ was offering him. All right. And then it says on page, one page over from that. His claim that he had kept the law of God was a deception. He showed that riches were his idol. He could not keep the commandments of God while the world was first in his affections. He loved the gifts of God more than he loved the giver. Christ had offered the young man fellowship with himself 
follow me, he said. But the Savior was not so much to him as his own name among men or possessions. All right. To give up his earthly treasure that was seen for the heavenly treasure that was unseen was too great a risk. He refused the offer of eternal life and went away. And never after the world was to receive his worship. Thousands are passing through this ordeal, weighing Christ against the world. And many choose the world. Like the young ruler, they turn away from the Savior, saying in their hearts, I will not have this man as my leader. Now, let me just pause here because this is very important that part of the reason that this is true, that people leave Christ to go and chase the world is because their view of Christ is skewed. And I wonder if this was true for the rich young ruler, right? It just, it just makes you wonder if he really knew who Christ was because can you really know who Christ is and choose the world over him? And so it's important that we as parents are giving a correct demonstration of who God is. Because if we are not giving a correct demonstration of who God is, then our children are going to reject God or what we have shown them to be God. And even the world would be more desirable to them than a God that is the way that we have said that he is. Does that make sense? And so if you think of like the French Revolution, how did the French Revolution come about? Because the view of God was inaccurate. And so the people said, if that's who God is, then we will just not believe in God. We will just live a life without God. And so they became atheists because surely it must be better to live without God than to serve a God that acts like what you have said he acts like. That's why Christ left out the commandment about covet because that is the one he was struggling with. Okay, right? You see what I'm saying? And so we want to make sure that we are not... A stumbling block because we claim to serve God but we're not modeling him we're not we're not displaying his his attributes we don't display his love and his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness and we'll talk about that in a little bit when we come to to discipline all right um I don't know if it's necessary for me to read this part i'll read this part on the next page selfishness was the sin of the rich young ruler unselfishness would be its cure love was the tool jesus used with him in teaching our children unselfishness love must be the motivating factor that moves them to overcome and we will come back to this point um like i said when we're discussing discipline okay then on the next page it's talk it talks about marriage and how the secret to a successful marriage is that each person serve the other and that their their highest goal is that the other might be happy and it says in the middle of the page to be in the highest degree happy we must each prefer the happiness of another to our own and so we are modeling through the marriage relationship this unselfishness and so a lot of children are taught selfishness through beholding through um watching the the marriage of their parents and and how they behave and so, you know, they're, they're learning by example that, you know, I satisfy myself and you satisfy yourself. And, you know, that's, that's how it goes. And so we want to be careful that we're not teaching them this behavior by 
example by default, right? Because obviously we wouldn't teach them that purposefully, but we can we can definitely teach them um, and, and not even intend to to do so. Okay. And then it says at the bottom on the right hand side to cultivate affection then is not to strive too excited by any direct effort of abstract thinking, but to show by the whole tenor of a life of disinterested goodness that your happiness is really promoted by seeking the happiness of another. So what does this mean? So we're not necessarily looking for certain times or certain instances also although we're going to use those like i mentioned before we're going to look for times to to be kind to other people to do things for them to bake something to write something to make something to visit them we're going to we're going to look for these opportunities but we don't want it to be so that our life is just these opportunities the entire bit the entire tenor of our life should be such that we are thinking of others so what does that look like we go to the store we're holding the door open for people we see somebody has a buggy we're going into the store we're going to take their buggy and we're going to return it to the store you see like just just little things that you're thinking of a person to ease their burden is not a huge thing it's just a little thing but it becomes the the way or the tenor of your life that you're always looking for ways to assist others the cashier is trying to put your stuff in the bag she's having a hard time you're gonna hold the bag for her there's no one in the bag you're gonna book bag the groceries yourself you're gonna help to lighten the burdens of others in in any way possible um, and we're going to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit because if you don't think about these things, if you just pray and ask God to show you these opportunities, he will do that. And you will notice that you will catch them more than miss them because you will learn to hear the Holy Spirit say, right over there, that lady's having trouble. She's trying to hold her baby and she's also trying to get something off the shelf. Go over there and get that off the shelf for her. Okay? And then you're going to go over there and you're going to say, ma'am, which... Which can are you trying to get? With whatever you're trying to get, and then you're gonna grab it for her, and then you're gonna see the look of gratitude. She may not even say thank you. You're gonna see. She might be shocked, right? Because no one ever helps her. She's been holding this baby 50 times in the store and struggling, and no one has ever helped. But she's gonna see that you noticed that she was struggling, and you will see the gratitude on the face. And many times, you will even get a thank you. And it feels good to get a thank you. Um, but, you know, we're not doing it for the thank you, right? All right. Um, let's move on. Are you guys still there? My screen seems to be stuck on my computer. Let's see if I can refresh it. Okay, you guys are there. Excellent. All right. So now on the next page, we have a comparison of selfishness and selflessness, right? And we have covetousness versus self-denial. So I'm wishing I had other people's things versus I'm okay not having those things. I'm content. Okay, thank you guys. Ambition versus modesty. I'm trying to show myself off to the world versus I'm not necessarily trying to disappear into the background, but I'm not trying to bring attention to to my person. Um, jealousy versus generosity and then intemperance versus temperance. And this is good to go along with the love study, the greatest of these that is available in the Google Drive because you will see that these character traits are listed under certain parts of the 1 Corinthians 13. And it's very powerful because it gives you some insight into which parts of 
love are lacking, right? So this selfishness, selflessness, excuse me, are all the outflow of perfect love. And so when we love God perfectly, meaning that his love is perfectly manifested in us because we have found the way of surrender, self is dead. We crucifying self every day, keeping it dead. And so the love of God is being perfected and that love of God, which has been imputed to us, will then be imparted and that impartation will show through the manifestation of our generosity, of our kindness, of our love, of our mercy, of our sincerity. These are the fruits of the the grasping of the concept of God's love, if that makes sense. So God plants the seed of his love in our heart. And as that seed blooms, as it, as it germinates, as it takes root, it will produce fruit. And so we can know when we see, you know, things that are off, that there's something wrong with, with the root. And so we want to become masters and go into the root of the problem, which is always a lack of love. And that's why we must discipline in love because the fruit that we're seeing is from a lack of love. And so it will only be corrected if we deal with it in love. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. All right. You know, it's kind of like the weed. So if you just keep plucking it, it's just going to grow back. You have, you got to pull it up from the root. Like, have you ever weeded something? If you just pluck that weed up from the top, then you're going to go out in a week and it's going to be back and it's going to bring a friend, right? <laughs> it's, it's just, it's not, you can, you can mow it and you just going to take the seeds and spread it around the yard. But you don't want to mow the weeds. It doesn't get rid of them. It spreads them, right? So you you can cut your child down all you want. And it, it will look like they're in submission. And then when they come back, they will be in rebellion. Like never, amen, praise God. Did you, right? So, and this is why it's so important to get these lessons from nature and the garden. Because you can see it. It's just like, oh yeah. <laughs> you cut down those weeds if you want to. And you're just going to have weeds all over the yard. <laughs> right? Ask me how I know. <laughs> Okay. All right. We're going to move on to part two, which is children respond to love, which is kind of what we're just talking about, right? Do not, I beg of you, correct your children in anger. I beg of you. She's beg. Do not correct your children in anger. That is the time of all times when you should act with humility and patience and prayer then is the time to kneel down with the children and ask the lord for pardon seek to win them to christ by the manifestation of kindness and love and you will see that a higher power than that of earth is cooperating with your efforts okay and then we're going to skip on down do not give them, the children, the impression that they must submit to control because it is your arbitrary will. Because I said so. <laughs> have you said that? I have. Because they are weak and you are strong. This is a struggle. Amen. It's a struggle. Why? Because that's how we were raised. I cannot count how many times my mother said, because Mommy, why do I have to do it? Because I said so. Because I'm the mama. <laughs> right? You have heard that. And then you did it because you had to. Right? And so these are what is meant by hereditary and cultivated tendency. It comes naturally. Why? 
because you were trained in it. Okay? And especially for us that this this can be a cultural thing, right? Um, at least the way that I grew up, there was a way that black women raised their children. And there was a way that white women raised their children. The Asians did something completely different. It, culturally, this is the way that you got your children in line. And you were not being true to your culture if you did it in a different way. You don't spank your children. What is, you know, and you would be ridiculed if, if you didn't do it the way that it was supposed to be done. And so we, we have been taught a certain way. And so really, a, a, a brunt, a, a big portion of, yes, I truly believe this culture Exactly. It's culture. And especially if you have grown up with island parents from Jamaica, um, African parents, um, you know, the parents from Guyana, especially the island people. The island people are known to just be brutal and, and, and cruel. And so we, what I was going to say is that for the disciples, a big part of their problem in having victory and in understanding the things of Christ is because they had to unlearn half of the stuff that they had known, more than half. Maybe, yay, nine of we have been taught the wrong way. And the truth of the matter is, we just don't know the right way. And so that's what makes. We do it. <laughs> right? Like. If I don't yell. Then they're just not going to do anything. Right? Because it's only when I yell that they get up and move. Because I said it five times. And they hadn't moved yet. But when mama raised her voice. Oh they got to move it. And so we have believed this deception that the only way I can get them to listen is to yell but here's the thing what has happened is we have thought that there was only two ways I yell or I don't yell right <laughs> but the truth of the matter is maybe when I didn't yell it didn't work but it's because I still wasn't following the method of God. It takes faith to believe that God's way will work. Thank you, Anika. It takes faith. Now, I'm going to say this again, y'all, because we got to bring it full circle. And I know y'all, sometimes y'all probably be wondering, why don't you keep saying things? But repetition deepens the oppression, right? So do you guys remember before when I said God's ways don't make sense? Like, and I'm not saying that in a disrespectful way. So... You tithe, you give away your money, and then you have more money? That makes no sense. You tell me how that makes sense. It doesn't. So I had $100, but if I give the Lord 15 then it's going to be as if I had more? Yes, because that's God's way. God says, give me some of your money, and I'm going to make it go further. That sounds like a hustler. Do you hear what I'm saying? No. Mm -mm. So I'm just going to keep it all. Because if I give the Lord some, I'm not going to be able to pay the rent. <laughs> That's not how it works, though. When you give the Lord his money, he will bless you in ways. And I'm telling you, we could probably spend a whole prayer night all night with people giving testimonies of how God has blessed because they were faithful in their tithes and offering. Okay? Exercise. How is it possible that you exert energy and then you have more energy? How is that even possible? That makes no sense. So I'm tired, but if I go work out, I'm going to be less tired than I was. Anybody on here that works out that can give a witness? I know I can give a witness. When I'm tired, that's when I need to go work out. I don't want to work out because I'm tired, but I promise you if I don't work out, 
I'm going to be even more tired. It makes no sense. Okay? And so disciplining the children is no different. It's no different. It follows the same principles. Why would I not yell at the children? Right? That's what I'm thinking. That's what the natural mind is thinking. Because I have to yell to get them to do it. <laughs> no, you don't. What you have to do is learn how to cooperate with God. Right? Because the deception is that I'm getting them to obey. That's the problem. That's why it doesn't work. Because it's not you getting them to obey. It is God that brings obedience. Because if you're getting them to obey, that is legalism. That is obedience of law. That's why it doesn't work. Okay? And then now we yield and use the methods of Satan because he has deceived us. Oh, you want to get them to obey? You have to do it this way. Okay, well, obviously I do. And then now we do the methods of Satan because it seems to work. Okay? But we can see with our own eyes that it doesn't work. Yes, after you said this, I started biking when I was tired about God's grace. Amen! Amen. Thank you for sharing that, Karen. Okay? It doesn't make sense, y'all. I know. But the ways of, what does God say? My thoughts are not your thoughts. And when you start studying these, the principles, I'm telling you that cannot be more true. We do not think the way God thinks. And we also don't get the results that God wants when we don't follow his methods. Okay? And so when the children are being disobedient and when we're tempted to yell and scream and cry and do every other thing we have done, we must stop and pray. One, for our spirits to be under the control of God. And then for the spirit of our children to be under the control of God. And what will happen is that little hard-headed child who probably acts like me. Okay, we're just going to keep it real. The little hard-headed child who probably acts like me. Oh, dear father. Have you been to my house? <laughs> right? Okay, but this is humanity we're dealing with. And humanity is humanity. And humanity <laughs> is the same. So, we must learn to submit to God first. And then we can see our children submitting. And then God is going to work in our children what we could not accomplish in a hundred lifetimes. If we, if we had a thousand years to live, we wouldn't be able to accomplish it because the work of God is a supernatural work. And, you know, it just, it can't be done by human efforts. All right. Okay. Deal with your children in love. I think we kind of covered that. Okay, guys. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip. Well, I'm going to read I'm going to read this because I think it goes right along with what we're saying. And then I'm going to go through that little story. I love that little story. The mother must realize that God is her helper. Love is her success, her power. If she is a wise Christian, what kind of Christian? If she is a wise Christian, she will not attempt to force the child into submission. Did y'all hear that? I'm going to read that again. If she is a wise Christian, she will not attempt to force the child into submission. She will pray. And as she prays, she will be conscious of a renewal of spiritual life within herself. And she will see that at the same time, the power that is working in her is also working in the child. And the child in the place of being compelled, is led and grows gentler and the battle is gained. Amen? All right. And then over, I don't know what page this is now. It says, only those who will become co-workers with Christ, only those who will say, Lord, all I have and all I am is thine, will be acknowledged as sons and daughters of God. Okay? 
And then at the bottom, it says, parents must learn the lesson of implicit obedience to God's voice, which speaks to them out of his word. And as they learn this lesson, they can teach their children respect and obedience in word and action. Okay, we don't want to skip over that because this is so important. Parents must first learn the lesson of implicit obedience. And so I share with you guys, and I don't know if I've shared it this year, actually, maybe this was last class, I'll share it again. How I'm having this problem with my children and I'm calling them and I'm calling them and I'm calling them and they're just not coming. And I'm just, I'm so confused because I know they hear me calling them. And, and so I'm calling them. Did you guys hear me calling you? Yes, mommy. Why didn't you come? You know, I'm upset and I'm fussing. And I don't know what excuses they gave. And as I'm asking them, did they hear me calling them? The Holy Spirit says to me, did you hear me when I called you this morning to get up to spend time with me? Mm. 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 <laughs> showing me that this disobedience was directly related to my disobedience that was a painful lesson because I just did I just really didn't want to have that conversation what does that have to do with them coming I'm calling them they hear me they need to come when I call them because I'm their mother, right? And so, if I wanted them to come when I called, then I needed to come when God called me and to acknowledge that I have heard his voice and to obey when I hear it, right? And so, I can tell you when I gained victory in that area I, I saw a marked difference and it wasn't just a one-time victory because I would fall off in my worship time. God would be calling me. I'd be like, okay, Lord, five minutes, 10 minutes. Have you done it? The Lord calls you. You know, he's calling you. Okay, Lord, give me 30 minutes. Okay, Lord, I'm be with you. I'll be with you in just a minute. Like, who are we? Ha ha. <laughs> like, who are we to tell the Lord we'll be with him in a minute? Who do you think you are? <laughs> like, right. And when you think of it, you're like... Oh, wow. Like, why do I do that? I, I ask myself, why Why do I feel like I? it's okay to do that? I don't know. I don't, is it presumption? I don't know what it is. But the audacity that God is calling you and you tell him, hold on, hold on, Lord. Just hold on. I'll be with you in a minute. <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, insanity. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what it is. But, like, why do you think that's okay? <laughs> it's not. And so... Because we think that, we have passed that thought process on to our children. Are you guys with me? Are you following what I'm saying? And so, you don't have to ever express it audibly, but it comes out. Like, have you ever watched your children? Like, how do they know that? Like, it's something you struggle with and then you see it in them and like, like, how do they even know that they're, like, where did it even come from? It, it's, it's in their DNA. Like, it, it comes out. It's, it's hereditary. It's cultivated. It's, it's all of that. But you don't, you don't have to teach it. You're, you're already teaching it imperceptibly. Um, yeah. Okay. So I want us to go over this story before we go. And I think we're actually going to save the, study about the rod till next time because I really want us to go through that. So this story, the first time I read this story, like I wept because <laughs> I was so convicted. Um, and I was just like, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And I'm going to read it for those of you who, who may not have read it because I feel like it's so powerful. Um, it's called Leading Children to God. Parents can never be too deeply impressed with the importance of early leading their children to God and fixing in their infant minds a sense of his presence and of their dependence. If the following shall induce one parent who reads this story 
to make more prayerful efforts to train up his children for God and heaven, our labor will not be in vain. And then here's the story. A mother sitting at her work in the den overheard her child, whom an elder sister was dressing in an adjoining bedroom, saying repeatedly, as if in answer to his sister, no, I do not want to say my prayers. How many church members in good standing, thought the mother to herself, often say the same thing in heart, though they conceal even from themselves the feeling. Mother, said the child, appearing in a minute or two at the door of the room. The tone and look implied that it was only the morning salutation. Good morning, my child. I am going out to get my breakfast. Stop a minute. I want you to come here and see me first. The mother laid down her work in the next chair as the boy ran towards her. She took him up. He kneeled in her lap and laid his face down upon her shoulder, his cheek against her ear. The mother rocked her chair backwards and forwards. Are you feeling well this morning? Said she in a kind and gentle tone. Yes, mother, I am very well. I am glad you are well. I am very well too. And when I woke up this morning and found that I was well, I thank God for taking care of me. Did you? Said the boy in a low tone, half a whisper. He paused after it. Conscious was at work. Did you ever feel of my pulse? Asked his mother after a minute of silence. At the same time, taking the boy down and setting him in her lap and placing his fingers on her wrist. No, but I have felt mine. Well, do you not feel mine now? How it goes, beating? Yes, said the child. If it should stop beating, I should die. Should you? Yes, and I cannot keep it beating. Who can? God, a silent pause. You have a pulse too which beats in your bosom here and in your arms and all over you. And I cannot keep it beating, nor can you. Nobody can but God. If he should not take care of you, who could? I do not know, said the child with a look of anxiety and another pause ensued. So when I woke up this morning, I thought I would ask God to take care of me. I hope he will take care of me and all of us. Did you ask him to take care of me? No. Why not? Because I thought you would ask him yourself. God likes to have us all ask for ourselves. A long pause ensued. The deeply thoughtful and almost anxious expression of countenance showed that the heart was reached. Do you not think you had better ask him for yourself? Yes, said the boy readily. He kneeled again in his mother's lap and uttered in his own simple and broken language a prayer for the protection and blessings of heaven. Suppose another case, another mother, overhearing the same words, calls her child into the room. The boy comes. Did not I hear you say you did not want to say your prayers? The boy is silent. Yes, he did, says his sister behind him. Well, that is very naughty. You ought always to say your prayers. Go right back now and say them like a good boy and never let me hear of you refusing again. The boy goes back, pouting, and uttered the words of prayer while his heart is full of mortified pride, vexation, and ill will. Have mercy. Now, how many of us have been the second mother? Would be the second mother. You don't want to say your prayers. What kind of naughty little child is that? Right? Thinking that this response is acceptable of heaven. Why? Because that is the way we have been taught. That is the way that we were dealt with as children. But how wise this first mother who never chastised a child because he didn't want to pray but made him see how important it is for him to pray and thank the very God that gives him life that he might be able to pray. And now the child prays willingly and is thankful that he is alive. And so now his prayer is meaningful. It's purposeful. It's from his heart because he really is glad that God has 
woken him this morning and now he wants to thank God. And he's a little bit bothered that his mother didn't thank God for him. But she shows him that God would be pleased if he would tell him thank you. Oh, how this story warms my heart even now as I read it because this shows us the contrast of the two different ways. Both ways got the children to pray. But hopefully we can clearly see that only one way was the method of God. And how differently we would respond if treated this way. How differently our children will respond if treated this way. And so I hope it is our prayer and we will pray before we go that God will teach us to be this wise and to be this type of mother that is that is not condemning, that does not scold, um, not that she doesn't discipline, but that she disciplines in a way of love and in the way of this first mother that surely is the way of God. So, all right, we're going to stop there. And next time we'll pick up on the discipline. I'm going to make a note here. We'll pick up on our study of the discipline, the rod, um, and then we'll go on. He shall do a new thing. Amen. 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 He shall do a new thing. He shall give us a new heart. And with that new heart comes new thoughts, new motives, new ideas, a, a new way to do things. And, and we will know. And I can tell you that one of the ways that I knew that God was working in my heart is because he would give me ideas of things to say to my children. And they were foreign to me. I knew I didn't come up with that. Rivers in the desert. Amen. And we can think of that. Our heart is this dry desert. And God will be the living water. The water of life that springs up. And so we do not have to live in these dry places. And you don't even have to have any ideas. God will give them to you if you ask him. He will teach you. Um, I think about Cinda Osterman. And I was going to mention her when we got to this um, discipline. But I'll go ahead and mention her now just in case you want to listen if you have an opportunity. You can Google her name. She has a parenting series on, I think it's Vimeo. Is that the name of the website? She has a parenting seminar that she did at a church. And part of her testimony is that she's tried forever to record and like the recording never works. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, but this time she was recording and her husband was recording. And so they were finally able to get a recording of one of the weekends that she did. And actually I think there's two different ones on there. But anyway, she talks about how God taught her how to discipline her children. Like she didn't know. She was a biker mom. She was a part of a, a biking club and God delivered her from that. And when it came to her children, like they were just, they would fight and just do all kinds of stuff. And she just didn't know what to do with them. She prayed and asked God. And he taught her. Um, and she says she's so glad like that she didn't talk to anybody about it because she believes they would have talked her out of like, you know, or said things like that's not gonna work. But, like, she didn't even know that the ideas were crazy. She just knew they weren't hers. And God taught her step by step how to um, rear her children and, and how to work with them, even to the point of when she it was time to correct them, they would bring the rod of correction to be to be disciplined. And I knew when she said that, that it was God teaching her because what child would bring their own rod to be corrected? Only a child who has learned to submit to authority 
through through love would do that and so um we'll talk about that in our next scope and so yeah we never have enough time to to get to to through these things but we will talk about that because i think it's important to talk about um discipline godly discipline and how we need to learn the the ways of god and unlearn the ways that we have learned that just quite frankly are not of god and so we have to be willing to leave them behind and not be like their rich young ruler and, and go away sorrowful but be willing to take on a new way and be led of god so let's pray to end i hate to even get off here i feel like we have more to talk about but i have to go and i know you guys have things that you need to do to get ready for seven. Oh, let me just give you an update before i leave on my tooth so i went to the dentist um yesterday and found that there is a deep cavity in the tooth that was giving me a problem and so that's where my pain was coming from um the dentist believes that there was an infection in it and so it is no longer infected because whatever remedies i was doing actually cleared up the infection so that's good and so she said i either had the option to do a root canal which there's nothing wrong with the root so i'm not really sure why they would recommend that but anyway there's nothing wrong with the root of the tooth and so root canal or extraction um so i don't know you guys pray with me because I, I really feel like there may be another option i actually started doing some research on reversing cavities because maybe if i can reverse the cavity then they would give me um another option so if you guys have any natural remedies that you know of or anyone that you know of that has done cavity reversal or that did options other than um root canal or extraction please let me know and um yeah i think that's it all right well let us pray Lord, we are so thankful for this lesson of obedience. Lord, I ask that you would teach each mom, dad, educator represented here the lesson of obedience. How to first be obedient to you as our father that Lord as we have experienced obedience through love the obedience of love that we will then teach that lesson to our children I ask that you would go even before us and touch the minds of our children to work on their hearts that they would learn to cooperate with you to learn to cooperate with us as we are surrendered to you Lord, teach us your ways that our homes may be homes after the order of heaven, that they may be homes where the angels love to dwell, that they may be homes where love is the principle and foundation. Save us, Lord. Prepare us for your soon coming. Give us new hearts, new thoughts, a new way. May we be transformed. And may others see that our families are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And may they be drawn to him that they may surrender even their hearts. That you may have a people that are ready to go home and live with you for all of eternity. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you so much, Karen, for your prayers. I will be in prayer. If you guys have any information to share, please do so. I will be praying for you. This is where the lessons really get intense because now we are seeking to put into practice that which we are learning. 
and disciplining in love, being obedient because we have found a loving relationship with Jesus and the outflow of that relationship is obedience. And so be blessed. I am praying. I can't wait, wait to hear your victories and um, how God is teaching, how he is leading, how 